Last week, we uh, ended with the 33rd verse of Romans chapter 11. So we'll begin this week with the uh, 34th verse. Before we begin, though, let's have a short word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are certainly the most blessed of people. We are blessed because of your love for us and, and our desire to live according to your will. And may we subject our own will to thine, that we may be that blessed man. And we're blessed also for this word that we have to guide us through this life. And we pray that you'll bless our study of this word, that we, we, we may meditate on, it, meditate on it day and night and incorporate it into our very being. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> 34th of the verse of chapter 11 reads, For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has become his counselor? We have a question, okay, who has known the unrevealed mind of God? No one. We only know what he's revealed. First Corinthians, the second chapter, verse 16 says, For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? <clears throat> but we have the mind of Christ. That's been revealed to us. <clears throat> With whom has God sought counsel in reaching his conclusions or in devising his plan? No one. Isaiah, the fourth chapter, verse 13 says, Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord, or as his counselor has taught him? Or Jeremiah, the 23rd chapter, verse 18, For who has stood in the counsel of the Lord and has perceived and heard his word? Who, is, uh, who has marked his word and heard it? Who has taken into uh, God into his, who has God taken into his confidence and imparted to him his secrets? No one. Deuteronomy the twenty nine chapter verse twenty nine. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. In the thirty fifth verse of chapter eleven. Or who has first given to him, and it shall be repaid to him? That is, who is it that is given to the Lord before the Lord gave to him? No one. In Job, the 41st, 41st chapter of Job, uh, verse 11, it says, uh, Who has preceded me, God speaking, that I should pay him? Everything under heaven is mine. <clears throat> Consequently, no one can give God an unsolicited and original present. God gives to all, but expects in return only obedience. Since no one can be found who has first given to God, there is no one to whom repayment is due. God is no debtor. In the 36th verse, it reads, For of him and through him, and to him all are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> God is the first uncaused cause. Through his power all things have been brought into being, and by him all things are sustained. All things then are for his honor and pleasure. Since all things are of him, and through him, and to him, his absolute due is glory and honor forever. This last verse of chapter 11 concludes the uh, weightier and more argumentative uh, uh, portion of his epistle. He now, Paul now, presents those uh, practical lessons that grow out of the broad basis he's been laying down. So in chapter 12, verse 1, he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, <clears throat> uh, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Uh, 
ASB says spiritual service. And it's from the Greek the word logikos. We you know, we get the word logic from that, rational, logical. It's the only other citation in the New Testament is in uh first Peter the second chapter verse two where it's translated word. <clears throat> Paul does not command, but he affectionately implores his audience towards some desired end. His entreaty has its basis in the mercies of God, that is, which are all the provisions that God has made in the gospel for our salvation. Each provision proceeds out of God's mercy. <clears throat> Therefore, the totality of such provisions can be termed mercies. The term present uh, in the Greek carries uh, the idea that whatever is to be presented continues to be presented. <clears throat> that is, it's presented once and then let it remain presented. We are to present live bodies, not dead bodies. Bodies is not merely the fleshful, fleshly bones and tissue that constitute a man's uh, physical body no more. Bodies, however, are the means through which a man exercises either good or evil. <clears throat> no command can be obeyed and no kind of service to God can be rendered without the use of the body. It is used to serve the law of sin and therefore must be controlled or serve the law of righteousness, which must be promoted. <clears throat> Paul wrote in the in first Corinthians the sixteenth chapter uh, sixth chapter verses nineteen through twenty nine or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? and you are not your own, for you are bought at a price. <clears throat> Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Furthermore, he wrote in Romans the sixth chapter, verse 13, we've already covered that, and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. <clears throat> and in Romans the sixth chapter, verse uh, 19, I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh, for just as you presented your members as slaves in, of uncleanness and in of, uh, of uh, lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. <clears throat> So the idea is to present your bodies as living sacrifices, active instruments in service to God. <clears throat> the word uh, translated reasonable describes the word service and comes from the Greek logikos, uh, from which the words logical and or rational are derived. But what kind of service is this? It is a service that results logically from what proceeds. Presenting your body as a living, holy sacrifice to God is a service growing logically out of the premises furnished in the foregoing part of the letter. It is a consequence from those premises and follows from them in accordance with the laws of region, reason and logic. In view of the facts and teachings of the former part of the letter, presenting our bodies to God in the manner named is a reasonable or logical service. The word translated holy comes from a Greek word meaning and devoted to the gods. Any gift made by the Greeks to their gods was said to be devoted, holy. It came to mean devoted for a particular use and it has that application here. <clears throat> Our bodies as living sacrifices are devoted to the worship and service of God. 
there are no carnal uh, ordinances in Christianity. Every acceptable service is a spiritual service. Thus, to devote our bodies as instruments of service to God is acceptable to him. It is a reasonable service. <clears throat> in verse 2, it says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good, uh, prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. <clears throat> Now, Christians are not to copy the evil ways and practices of the world. Uh, certainly there are good and wholesome attributes of the world that the Christian may emulate, but things of the world that are evil in, the, in themselves or possess an evil tendency, that is, anything hostile to the life of a faithful Christian, are to be avoided. Indeed, such things must be opposed always and corrected if possible. <clears throat> the word transform comes from the Greek word meta, metamorpho. <clears throat> and we get that our English word uh, metamorphosis from that Greek word. You know, kind of like a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. Then it, uh, that's a process of metamorphosis. Well, it's a radical change. The mind is the subject of the uh, change. It is the thing that is to be changed. In other words, the mind, instead of being fashioned after this world, is to be so changed in belief, desire, and purpose as to lead a life unlike the world would expect. The pre-metamorphosis, unrenewed mind, fashions one life, one's life after the world. Whereas the post-metamorphosis mind is a renewed mind. It refuses to do so because of the antagonism between it and the world. One is to be changed in the mind by its being renewed. But this is not for the sake of change itself, but as it seeks another end. One is to be changed that he may correctly ascertain God's will without any encumbrances of the evil influences of the world. Uh, he may see what is perfect without flaw or defect. God has an expressed will for mankind uh, that regarding Christian conduct is good because it is right, perfect, without flaw or defect. And to judge it correctly, the mind must be renewed. In verse 3, he says, For I say through the grace given to me that to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. <clears throat> if this verse is uh, exegetic, and that just means he's been added for clarification, then it is presented to introduce an example showing uh, the need of things good, well-pleasing, and perfect. Paul says, quote-unquote, through the authority given him as an apostle, therefore he has the, it has the force of a charge. I charge you, that is, everyone who is among you, whether of high or low status, well-off or not, wise or unwise, everyone, no one is accepted. While the charge can be considered to be universal, it has more pertinence to those who are spiritually minded. To think of oneself uh, highly is to, to esteem oneself over much, is to be lifted up with pride, to have an unwarranted, unwarranted pride in oneself, or in one's accomplishments. To be conceited, to be arrogant, to be proud, to think highly of oneself, to think of others as inferiors, and you can go on and on. Uh, such pride is wholly inconsistent with the example and spirit of Christ. 
But be careful to think soberly. That is to evaluate things fairly and respectfully. Be just in your judgment. Make it a practice of thought not to overestimate your own gifts and talents, nor underestimate those of others. All talents have value, whether it is one the one talent or the ten. And the reverse is true as well. The words has dealt means to distribute. So we are to think soberly to the extent that faith has been distributed. But what is a measure of faith? Uh, when we get down to verse 6, we'll discuss that uh, further. But does it mean a portion of faith or is faith the, the instrument of measure? If the latter, then faith is the measuring instrument by which we are to measure our thinking. If faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans the uh, 19th chapter verse 17. Uh, I think I have a wrong site there. Uh, but anyway, then we should measure our thinking by the gospel as well as uh, we should. But here God is doing the distributing. The thing he is distributing is a limited portion of faith. If it is the miraculous, then it is the gift of faith spoken of in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 9. This faith is not the faith that comes by hearing and believing the gospel, but something miraculous. Now, such faith was never given to one who had not first come to a believing faith from the evidence presented by the gospel. The apostles likely possessed this miraculous faith uh, and endowed them with all spiritual powers. They had all the uh, powers of the Holy Spirit in full measure. To others, it was given in measured amounts, as were the other spiritual gifts, according to their ability to use them wisely and the necessities of the case. In verse 4, for as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. The bo human body is fearfully and wonderfully made. It is so complicated and interdependent that medical science has not yet ravel unraveled all its complexities. The body is con composed of many members performing functions peculiar to itself, but each supporting the whole. It is the same with the church. It is composed of many members, and each one is necessary to the health and well-being of the body. No one can be dismissed, nor can anyone claim superiority. In Paul's discourse on spiritual gifts, he had this to say about the church being composed of many members as recorded in 1 Corinthians, the uh, 12th chapter, verses 12 through 31. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greek, whether slaves or free. And all have been made to drink into one spirit, for in fact, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should, should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the, be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, well, uh, where would the body be? <clears throat> but now indeed, there are many members, yet one body in the eye. I cannot say the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head and feet, I have no need of you, uh, nor much rather the members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary, and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor in our 
and presentable parts have greater modesty, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, and that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and he's making the application here, and the members individually. And God has appointed the, uh, these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third uh, teachers. After that, miracles and gifts of healing, helps, ministration, variety of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? Or earnestly desire the best gifts? And yet I show you a more excellent way than he goes in, of course, the uh, uh, 13th chapter, uh, which is a great love chapter, if you will. <clears throat> in verse 5, <clears throat> uh, it says, so we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. There are many individual Christians the world over. All are in one body, the church of Christ. There is only one worldwide body, the church. Individual Christians, members of the one worldwide body, are organized locally into the church within a specific locality. One, uh, one is a member of the local church in some, not some local church on another continent while a member of the worldwide body. Christ is the head of the one worldwide body and of the locally organized body, the church, the local church. And as much as members worldwide compose one body, so are necessarily fellow members described here as members of one another. Our relationship to one another should be so close that none can feel superior, superior to the other. After all, Christ died for me as well as you. And uh, we'll stop here and we'll uh, commence with verse 6 of chapter 12 next week. Thank you.